Good evening, everyone. My name is Janaea Stanley, and I am the clinical supervisor at Roberta's House, and I want to welcome everyone to another episode of Real Talk Live, which is a series of live and recorded conversations about various aspects of grief. And tonight, I am joined by Roberta's House Executive Director, Mrs. Veronica Land Davis, and we have an esteemed panel of guests for you all tonight, Mr. Jabari Lyles, who is the Director of LGBTQ Affairs in the Mayor's Office. We also have Brother Merrick Moses, who is the Board Chair of the Pride Center of Maryland and, the vic and a Victim Advocate. And we have Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington, who is the President of the Washington Consulting Group and the Senior Pastor of United Unity Fellowship Church of Baltimore. Tonight, we will be talking about grief in the LGBTQ community. So I just want to say again, um, echoing my esteemed colleague here, uh, welcome to Real Talk. Um, it is a time where we really want to have an opportunity for everyone to really get a chance to talk about their grief as well as to educate and heal. So before we really get into the depths of our conversation tonight, I just want everyone to know who's listening to us, what's happening at Roberta's House. For those of us who are unfamiliar with Roberta's House, we are a family grief support center. We provide services to children as young as two to through 17, adults and families who are dealing with different types of losses. We have about 15 programs here at Roberta's House we provide services from working with moms that experience prenatal and infant deaths to survivors of homicide victims. We have been privileged to be in the Baltimore City Public Schools as well as Prince George's County Schools. We have a program here called Changing the Game, which is for our young people, 13 and 17, who are ex also experiencing some grief and loss. So if you are someone who's listening to us, if you know someone who may need support, please don't hesitate to give us a call. We are located 2510 St. Paul Street here in Baltimore City. And we are also located at Prince George's County. Our address there is 1802 Bright Seat Road in Landover, Maryland. So I wanted to really thank everybody, thank the community for coming out last Saturday. We had our crab and go. And we were able to really um, have the community support Roberta's House with our fundraisers. It was a tremendous success. So thank you everyone who came out and support us with this fundraiser. I also wanna to say to the families that are gonna be participating in Camp Aaron tomorrow, we have our virtual camp bereavement for young people 60, six to 17 tomorrow. Thursday and Friday, as well as Saturday. So we will gather together. We are not gonna allow the pandemic to keep us from having that experience for our young people. So we are excited about accepting you campers tomorrow morning. Also, I wanna just share with everyone, Roberta's House is in the last stages of building our state-of-the-art family bereavement center. We will be located in the 900 block of East North Avenue, and we are so elated because this is the first family grief support center located in Baltimore City, as well as we are first, to our knowledge, the first family grief support center that is managed by people of color. So we are excited about the opportunity to continue to serve our families. So in order, for, you can also join in our celebration. We have several things that we are offering to our community. One is you can buy a brick and we have extended our brick um, offer until August the 31st. So please go on our website. It will give you all the information you need as well as you can also contribute to our tree of life. And you can also buy a tree for those that you feel that are significant in your loved ones. So we want you to be part of our excitement as well. So on behalf of Roberta's House and all the families that we serve, we want you to know that we're here to serve. Okay. All right. Um, anything else? Did we miss anything else? Um, I think that's about it. 
we are starting our new fall groups beginning next month. So if there's any groups that you might be interested in, the adult group time of sharing, um, our men's group, um, our families group, everything will begin again in September. So if you are interested in any of our groups, um, please go to our website to contact the program managers to register for those groups. Um, the, everything will be virtual, so that's good. You don't have to worry about traveling anywhere. Um, so, you know, we're definitely here to support you all, and we're doing everything we can to make sure that our services um, are still able to be offered, even in the, you know, the situation with the pandemic. Yeah, and I also just want to add, too, one of the reasons why I think we have been successful with serving children and families is that Roberta's House really is a community-based organization. We could not do what we do without volunteers. So I just want to let those of us who want to join our team, join our family, that in September, I think it's September 13th through the 14th, we will have a volunteer training. So please, please reach out to our volunteer coordinator, who is Kelly Brooks. She will get you ready for your journey with us. But on behalf of the volunteers that we currently have, we want to say to you tonight, we couldn't do what we do without volunteers. So from my desk, it really does feel like we're a community-based organization because volunteers are really the link to what we can do. Okay. And we just want to um, throw some teasers out for next week. So next week, we are going to have, um, on Monday, we have a recorded live that was done by our HOPE program. And they were talking about grieving couples. And it is really a really, really, really good um, episode where they're talking about how couples were able to move through their grief journey together and the differences between men and women men and women grieving. So that's on Monday, so tune in for that. And on Wednesday, we will get an update on our men's group from our program manager, Adam Johnson, and he's gonna have our other um, male facilitators come. You guys will have a conversation um, about the, males, the male grief group. So I'm excited to get information about that. That's been going on this summer. So um, that's one of our new programs. So I'm really, really excited to hear what, what's been going on there. And we're just encouraging all guys to come out. Um, they were having drop-in groups. This past Monday was the last drop-in group that they had. And basically guys can just call in. Um, but now beginning in September, you'll have to register for the group. It's a 10 week group, I believe. Yeah. Um, and so every week the guys will do through Zoom will meet and they'll be able to talk about any issues that are related to grief. Um, so I'm excited about that. So that'll be on Wednesday. So we have some great things coming up. This is August is Grief Awareness Month. And we just, as Roberta's House, as a Family Grief Support Center, we want to just talk about grief. We want to talk about areas about areas of grief that are not as well known. And so that's one of the reasons why um, we put this um, conversation together, grief in the LGBT, LGBTQ community. So we're going to get us started a little early, but we'll get started with our um, talk tonight. And we just want to welcome anyone who was just joining us. We are talking about, we are talking with um, three distinguished guests. And so we're going to have them introduce themselves one by one. First, we're going to start with Mr. Jabari Lyles, who is the director of the LGBTQ affairs in the mayor's office. <clears throat> Awesome, thank you so much, Shania, and thank you, Veronica, um, for having me um, with such really awesome co-panelists as well. Um, really excited to discuss this topic. Uh, so my name is Jabbar Lyles, as was mentioned. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I work in the mayor's office of Baltimore City as the director of LGBTQ affairs. Um, that's where I advise and um, work with city government and the mayor on the needs and experiences of the LGBTQ community. Um, it's a newer position, but it's such an important position. I wish every city in the country had an LGBT internal advocate. Um, and I take it very seriously and I, I love the job so much. Um, my background is in nonprofits and teaching. I've been a local LGBT community member um, and leader here in Baltimore for a while. 
Um, I'm a former teacher here in Baltimore City. Um, a lot of my work focuses around LGBTQ youth, um, and I do a lot of really focused work uh, with the trans community as well. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mr. Lyles. Next, we will hear from Brother Merrick Moses, again, who is the board chair of Pride Center of Maryland and a victim advocate. Brother Moses, could you introduce us, introduce yourself to us and your work? You're on mute. You gotta unmute yourself. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Okay. Oh, the sound's not going well. It's breaking up a lot. Can we come back to you? Yes. Okay, we'll come right back to you. Okay. Next, we will hear from Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington, who is the president of the, let me, let me get the whole thing. One second. He is the president of the Washington Consulting Group and the senior pastor of Unity Fellowship Church of Baltimore. Reverend Washington, can you introduce yourself to us and talk a little bit about your work? You're muted also. Thank you. Um, <laughs> these, these Zoom platforms, all right. Yes. So I want to say thank you to Jenea and to Veronica for having us uh, on this very, very important um, opportunity conversation. So um, this invitation gave me an opportunity to learn about um, Roberta's House. I did not know a whole lot about uh, Roberta's House before this invitation and just honoring um, the work and the labor and the importance of what you're doing and particularly at this um, this conversation around uh, grief and what it means, particularly in the LGBTQA and I plus communities. Um, Jamie Washington, uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. And I am zooming in today from the original homelands of the Piscataway tribe here in Baltimore County. Um, I start by honoring the land um, and the legacy of the space that I get to occupy. Um, and I don't take that for granted. Um, I get to serve in the world, um, and the honor of serving in the world is um, the senior pastor of Unity Fellowship Church of Baltimore under the leadership of uh, Bishop Harris Thomas, our presiding prelate and founding pastor of the church back in 2000, um, the Unity Fellowship Church movement, um, Archbishop Carl Bean, who in fact, Unity Fellowship Church movement was founded in a moment of profound grief um, and loss. And so it was founded based upon the uh, deep loss during the 1980s and the AIDS crisis at the heart of the AIDS crisis when churches were not burying or funeralizing um, its, its gay, um, particularly gay male leadership and particularly that in the black community. So. We have a strong, strong uh, history of holding people in time of trauma and loss. Uh, and we'll talk more about that as we move forward, but I serve in, in that capacity and as a part of a movement and a, a church family that is committed to that. I also serve as the board chair for Many Voices, um, which is uh, an African-American based uh, black church movement uh, for in support of LGBT families um, and, and, and communities. And as the president of the Washington Consulting Group, which is a transformational organizational change organization that is working to help heal the planet um, in, through the lens of uh, all areas of oppression, but specifically uh, addressing systemic racism, um, anti-blackness, um, heterosexism, homophobia, transphobia, um, and gender. So those are the ways in which I get to serve in the world and I'll stop there and hand off to my brother, Moses. Thank you, Dr. Washington. Is this better? 
actually it's not. A little bit. It was it was actually a little better, Moses um, Merrick, when you when you didn't have those on for a minute. Because right right before you right before you went off, it got a little bit better. Yeah, I didn't have anything in. I'm sorry. I hope that everyone can hear me. I am Brother Merrick Moses. I um, serve as the board chair, board president of the Pride Center of Maryland, and I'm also a victim advocate. I work with victims of violence uh, in the courthouses here in uh, the town of Baltimore. I also am an old Catholic priest and monk. So I was ordained to the priesthood in 2008, and I made my profession to uh, to the Benedictine movement in 2016. Um, I've been uh, a minister in this community for over 15 years, and I've seen a lot in my time. I've conducted funerals for people, and of course, provided counseling. And I feel that it is my honor and my calling to serve this community. Great, great, great. Thank we you want to thank so much. You so much, so much. So let's let's begin our dialogue or continue our dialogue because what our viewers don't know is that we started this conversation yesterday and we want to pick it up today. So I just want us to start off with um, panelists is to answer the question, how has grief impacted the work that you do now in the community? I know we kind of talked about it as you introduced yourself, but if we could spend some time to really talk about how has grief really impacted your work, your work as service in the community? I'll get it started. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that grief shows up in, in my work, um, but it's something that we, you know, have to wrestle with. And particularly with my work with young people, and my work with the trans community, uh, we've seen a lot of really unfortunate loss over the years. Um, you know, I used to work with an organization that did LGBTQ work in K through 12 schools. Um, and between the years of, you know, 2005 to 2015, you would turn on the news, you know, and almost every month, you would hear of a different young person who um, has decided to take their own life because they just couldn't handle um, the, the hate, um, the discrimination and the dehumanization that they've faced at the hands of their classmates, um, their teachers, sometimes their, their own family members. Um, and so, you know, that has really created a real sense of urgency for me in my work um, that we can't be complacent, we can't sit on our hands because uh, young people are dying and they're dying because of the things that we are failing to do. Um, and it was just so heart-wrenching to have to mourn the loss of, you know, young people as young as nine, 12, 15, um, who because of the weight of the hate that folks have given to them, you know, no fault of their own, because mm -hmm. they're just walking the life, um, to walk in this earth being themselves, um, that that is a decision that they, were forced to make. Um, so that grief and that loss has been really tough um, to deal with. Um, and then I will also say that, you know, over the years, um, being a local community leader, you know, we were just talking about this yesterday, you know, Merrick and I are often called on to, to participate in vigils and remembrance services. Um, each year we have the Transgender Day of Remembrance here in Baltimore City um, that's planned in part of the Transgender Response Team. Um, convened by the Maryland Department of Health and Jean-Michel Brevel. And, um, you know, that's just one moment where the community gets together and reads literally hundreds of names of transgender people that have been taken from us just in that past year. It takes probably 45 minutes, maybe even more, just to read each name. And it's a really heavy event. Um, it's really beautiful in the way that we honor and give space to each individual person. Um, but the fact that we even have to do that uh, is tough. And so uh, I don't want to make, you know, the murders of Black trans people just another headline or another phrase that's happening in the news. It's something that real people are going through, real family members are lost, real lives are taken. Um, and so it, it sort of eliminates any complacency. It's, it's urgency. 
um, and dealing with that loss, I hate to say that um, in some way it fuels the work, but if we, we don't get real about the fact that we're losing our siblings, um, then we'll really not understand the urgency of the work. So um, really seeing young people being lost and um, our trans siblings being lost is, is some of the, the biggest ways I've dealt with grief in my work. Um, Reverend Washington, what, what sure. has your journey been like? Well, so what um, I really do appreciate what Jabari is naming and framing in terms of, you know, particularly our young people, as well as um, the lives of our trans siblings um, and what, how, what that means. And for me, the whole, um, as a person who has been in ministry for many, many years, and one of the clearest ways that I got um, my understanding around how heterosexual privilege shows up in the world is that often queer, uh, gender nonconforming LGBT folks, they lose God. And so God gets taken away from us when we um, are told that God is not pleased with us as we are. So the grief, the death of that relationship leads to the mindset that has people then believe that their lives are not worth living, their families believe that they deserve the treatment that they get. So there is a death that occurs even before the physical death that is traumatizing and often not named. So we have lots of people walking around in the LGBTQA and I plus community who are spiritually dead because of the ways that we have been told in often Christian churches um, that we are not worthy and don't belong. So when I began to think about the work of grief in our communities, it starts even before the loss of physical life, right? Um, and that there is um, the, the, the healing and the moving through. So if you think about the stages of grief, and I know that you all know this as we talk about shock, denial, pain, anger, depression, all of those things, those are the lived experiences that um, LGBTQ and A implied folks navigate as they come to their truth, as they share with their families, um, as they share with their best friends, as they share with their teachers, as they share with their ministerial leaders, right? And so they go through this process of having to grieve the life that they knew and then have to reconstruct a way to be in the world in a new, um, in a new way. Right. Um, some some of us are fortunate enough to have um, role models and mentors and folks um, like Jabrari, like uh, Brother Moses, but uh, uh, like the Unity Fellowship Church movement. But everyone's not, um, and everyone doesn't have access in those same ways. So that death, which precedes the physical death, often, and then when the physical death happens. Um, and as I've just experienced with a number of my uh, members and so on and so forth, how uh, LGBT folks get treated, how they get seen, what happens in the relationships, um, all of those are dynamic. So as a, uh, as a clergy person, I get to see some of the worst um, and the best of us in those times, right? And so um, you'll, you'll see folks who are gender nonconforming and um, uh, uh, folks whose gender identity and expression um, is not in alignment with the sex they were assigned at birth. Families didn't agree with that. So come funeral, we gonna get them back to what we believe God had them to be. And we, we are dressing them in ways and um, dis, just on, dishonoring their whole lives and their partners and so on and so the, the impact of that grief is huge. It's huge. 
I think oh, it we... looks like we lost Veronica. Hopefully mm -hmm. she'll be back shortly. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, um, Reverend Washington. Brother Moses, could you um, just tell us how grief has impacted your work as well? Well, I've been called on to do funerals times because people can't afford me to a minister um, or they don't even know what to do. We are um, really not hearing you, bro. Can you hear me now? No. Oh, it's just we, real fuzzy. Go ahead, go ahead, talk. Uh, lean sorry, lean up and talk on. like that. Um, oh, I was saying that. So for me, uh, people follow me to do funerals, and I also do counseling for people who have suffered loss, a peer counseling. And it is oftentimes our grief is compounded by lack of acceptance for our family, from my family, as Dr. Washington was saying. Um, Losing not just family, but losing possessions, being dishonored because one of them put out the house. And some people, as Dr. Washington was saying, we give up on God. So, what I try to I try to help people in their spiritual walk and guide them to where they can go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Looks like Veronica is joining us again. Great. The storm is probably going to give us a whole lot of issues, but we're gonna work through it. Mm -hmm. So I do have a question, um, cause I'm not sure if our entire audience is familiar. Could you guys please define LGBTQ and what each of those mean? Um, and Reverend Washington mentioned some others that I don't think I've heard before. So if you guys can just explain what they are to our audience. So I wanna make sure everybody's clear. <laughs> Excellent. Jabari, I'm going to hand that off to you, given your role within the, the, the city to kind of share with the people, you know, this is who I'm serving, right? So, I uh, the city, please. absolutely. Um, and, you know, as we were talking, I, met, I was realizing that we, we've rattled off LGBTQ a couple of times. And usually when I love, like, you know, give talks and things, it's important that we talk about, we say the words, right? Um, because I feel like, um, we've weaponized these words. We've added bad things to these words, and these are these words are gorgeous. These words are beautiful. They explain who we are. Um, we teach young people that they can't say these words, and that's just not true. So, uh, LGBTQ stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. Sometimes the Q can mean questioning as well. Um, lesbian is a word that's used a lot for women. Um, and it's to describe a sexual orientation, whereas a woman is attracted, whether it's sexually or romantically, uh, to another woman. Um, gay is a word that's used a lot for men, but can be used freely for anyone um, to mean that they are attracted to some people of the same gender. Um, and some is really important. Not all, you know, some, just like everybody else. Um, bisexual is a term uh, that people use to define if they are uh, attracted sexually or romantic to people of more than one gender. That's the way I like to say. Um, some people define bisexuality as being attracted to just two, uh, focusing on that prefix of bi meaning two. Uh, but some folks just say it's you're attracted to more than one gender. Um, you may have also heard pansexual, which is sometimes included there, uh, which is also attraction to, you know, more than one gender. It's really about attraction or capacity to be attracted to anybody regardless of their gender. Um, T is for transgender, um, and a transgender person is someone who has a gender identity, so that's their personal deeply held understanding of their gender. Um, that's different from what... Yeah, You're here. You didn't storm, go away. this storm is, is something. That it just cut my whole thing off. <laughs> wow. 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 Um, so that means someone's gender identity is different from um, the sex that they were assigned at birth, right? So a medical professional may say, it's a girl, which is all about biological sex and has nothing to do with all of the norms and expectations that we've tacked on to that word girl um, and all that stuff is called gender. So transgender people understand themselves better than anybody else does, right? And that understanding is um, different from whatever the doctor said. Um, queer is kind of an umbrella term. Um, it encompasses many things. And basically if it's not happened again, uh, someone who is not straight, 
um, who is not cisgender, and that's a term that we mean for someone who isn't transgender. Um, so if it's something else, right, if someone who are part of the sexual and gender minority spectrum, you could adopt queer as a word um, to describe your identity. Um, and then uh, Dr. Washington talked about the I, uh, which is intersex. Um, someone who is intersex, it's a medical anomaly, doesn't happen very often, where someone's sex assigned at birth cannot be easily determined. Um, some people may have used the term hermaphrodite in the past, and that's, if you use that term today as an invitation to forget it um, and to use the word uh, intersex instead. Um, and then the A uh, stands for asexual, um, and that's a sexual orientation that just means you're, you don't experience sexual attraction to any gender. Um, and then there's the plus, which is just a whole bunch of other, you know, there's two spirit, which is an indigenous um, identity. Um, you can always follow me on Baltimore City LGBTQ Affairs. We try to offer LGBTQ 101 um, for city residents as a free service in partnership with Enoch Pratt so that folks can just learn about what these terms mean, what they mean in context, the do's and the don'ts. Um, but that's a little just LGBTQ quick 101. Excellent. Thank you. Thank Excellent. you. That was very helpful because that definitely don't recall hearing the A and the I. So I'm glad that you clarified that. I, I'm, I, the definition, I understand it. I just never heard of it the way that you explained it. So thank you very much, Debra. I appreciate that. So our next question, how has grief impacted you personally? Is there any stories or anything you'd like to share about the impact that grief has had on you personally? Anyone can go. Well, well um, when I was 16, um, my cousin, who I grew up with, he was like my brother, only two years younger than me, was murdered in front of a post office. And I'm originally from New York, um, in Jamaica, Queens. And from there, out of our, my grief and the grief of other relatives, we started a group called Climb, and that went to the longevity and improvement of male black. And that is how I started to become an advocate. I learned how to advocate out of the grief and loss of my cousin. Um, even today, I think about what would it be like for him to belong to um, the man he was and things of that nature. Um, grief has been my primary. It, had, it used to fuel my action in terms of getting involved in different causes. Um, now so much I see my grief and the grieving as a blessing because I need better to be able to help other people I end up there like you. Thank you. Um, I can jump in also with a story. Um, when I was two years old, I had an uncle who passed away. Uh, the, the family called him Uncle Bunny. I don't really know why how, how he got that um, nickname. Um, and the, all that I knew about him is that he served in the military in some capacity and he was super good at math. Um, and it wasn't until I was, and they also said that he died of cancer. It wasn't until I was older that I learned Uncle Bunny died of AIDS, <laughs> right? And the fact that my family said it was cancer means so much to me that that has always, and it's not a mystery, I completely understand or how they arrived at that thought of saying that, did they think that um, the, the topic of HIV and AIDS was not something that a child could understand? Um, did they shy away from the fact that my uncle was a bisexual man and by minimizing the way that he died also minimized his bisexual identity? Um, why did they feel as though they needed to protect me from that information? You know, I'll never know. Um, as I've gotten more you know, older, I started to kind of put the pieces of his life back together and understand that he was openly bisexual. And there were members of my family that completely embraced that and loved that. And then there were members of my family that didn't, um, you know? And so just kind of like hearing about that really taught me a lot about how far my family has come. Um, for me, I started to study math when I was in school. So it was really cool to have like, you know, that connection to him in some way. We we're both queer men in my family um, who were both really good at math and um, 
I, I always feel a connection to him and I continue to learn more about his life. And so I feel like I continue to grieve him and I don't even really know who he is. Um, so, you know, his, his name was uh, Maurice Isaac and um, I'll always hold him in my heart because he's like one of the only other queer relatives that I know in my family. And even his story was, uh, was try like hidden in some way. Um, and so he, he, his is a memory that I carry on all the time. We have a question um, from our audience. The question is about um, explaining gender non-conforming. Great, and so I can take that also. Um, so gender non-conforming is a phrase that describes someone who's either their gender identity, so who they are, or their gender expression, which is what you may see. Um, whatever that is, does not conform to our dominant idea of gender, right? right? And so when we think about men and masculinity, there's a thought. When we think about women and femininity, there's a thought. Um, and what that does is create sort of this binary understanding of gender. And gender nonconformity is really about um, breaking away from that conforming of a binary understanding of gender. And it can look many different ways. It doesn't always have to look like androgyny, right? It doesn't always have to look like a mixture of masculinity and femininity. It's basically a, a way to declare that this person's approach to gender does not conform to the dominant approach of gender. I consider myself a gender not conforming person. I have my nails painted just because I, I, I like the color. Um, <laughs> for some people, you know, uh, this doesn't conform to the idea of what men should do or would do with their gender expression. So I think, you know, in my gender expression, I'm often very gender not conforming, um, which is just, you know, my way of not conforming to the typical understanding of, of gender. I would just add to Jabari, who just named it beautifully, the, the, the gender box, right? The box that we get um, either assigned in um, at birth or the box that people assume based upon what they see. Um, and so, or even the box that folks um, in, embrace based upon the shared pronouns that we use, right? So I can use um, uh, male or masculine pronouns and still be gender nonconforming, right? So those are the pronouns, but um, I dress um, in this way. I behave, I engage in these ways. So I um, don't confine myself to the box um, mm -hmm. that, um, gets associated uh, with, with uh, particular uh, gender uh, stereotypes and so on. And so um, again, that, that's, that, that's a blowing of our mind. That, and, and for lots of folks, that's another death, right? Mm -hmm. It's another grieving process that has to happen because um, that's not who I thought my son would be. Okay, I could deal with my son's attraction too but why does he need to do this? Or why does my daughter need to do that? And, um, and so it's uh, really a um, eradicating and a dismantling of the social construct of gender. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, that, uh, uh, and, and the thing about it is it has nothing to do with sexual orientation, right? So mm. um, that, um, that, you know, because, uh, uh, one who, is a, who identifies as male, was assigned male at birth, decides to polish his fingers, does not mean that he's attracted to men. Mm -hmm. the, right. the, that's, the, that's something else altogether, right? So, um, yeah. To give so, you an illustration of what they're talking about, sexual orientation is who you go to bed with, whereas gender identity is who you go to bed at. And that was said by John, Janet Ma, and uh, she's a trans woman. She um, also also a TV producer, right? Yep. Who you go to bed with, or with. who you go to bed as? Very clear, right? Janet was very clear in that. Thank mm -hmm. you, for that, Brother Moses. Yep. Thank you so much. That this, I'm just excited. Um, you know, as someone who as a social worker, first and foremost. Um, I never want to offend, you know, I never want to assume. So how can someone respectfully ask or approach or, you know, without making assumptions, if they see someone 
who looks feminine, but they don't necessarily know what their pronouns are or what have you. How how can we approach someone without being offensive? How can we how can we do that? I always like to say that it's better to ask someone's pronouns than assume them. Mm -hmm. um, so assumptions aren't great. And so if you feel as though you need to ask, um, there's a way to ask, right? So there isn't like a, so what do I call you? You know, he, she, they, right. that doesn't sound very sensitive. I think the best way to do it, I like to model. So I say, hey, so hey, how you doing? I'm Jabari, I use he, him pronouns. Um, what pronouns feel good for you? You know, what pronouns should I use for you? Um, and then some people are just gonna be blown away that you even have the knowledge to ask about pronouns, right? Mm -hmm. And will really uh, sincerely appreciate and say, oh, thank you, my pronouns are X. There are gonna be some people who get pissed off and they're gonna be like, what pronouns? What do I look like, right? And so then you have a choice, then you can return that aggression to them, right? Or you can absorb it and be like, I'm so sorry, I just wanted to know the best way to respect you. And we can figure out why somebody might feel hostile if their pronouns are in question. That can equal death for some people, right? Um, that can be like, are you seeing something that other people are seeing that I'm not trying to display? Why are you questioning my pronouns? And so I think that sometimes we get into this like pronouns debate where, oh, I don't wanna ask this person about their pronouns because what if they get mad and you know say that I'm being disrespectful to them? Um, I think it's important that we give space for folks. Um, and then that's not, that's, if that's the biggest deal of your day, then you got some other issues, you know, to deal with. Um, respectfully ask, model your own. You don't want to ask somebody to give something that you wouldn't be willing to give yourself. Um, and then go from there. Thank you. Thank you. And the other piece that I would just add is your authenticity comes through, right? Mm -hmm. So. You know, just trans, I always say transparency is our friend, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know what I'm doing here. I do know I care and I wanna be respectful. Um, mm -hmm. And so this this may sound wrong. It might not come out in the right way. Thank you, Bob. But this is what I'm I'm seeking, right? In this moment. So so, so what, what I, you know, often will counsel and advise folks around is there's no, cookie cutter, one way, right answer, right? And so, you know, I appreciate as Jabari named, you could be as respectful in that and that that can be your intention does not meet your impact, right? You had a different impact than you intended. You get to then again, um, as was named, you decide how you're going to um, engage that, right? Um, but uh, I always say, you know, just, I said, tell the truth. Just tell the truth, right? You know, um, and you and make a mistake, right? That's right. You know, like let's talk about making a mistake because we will make mistakes. We're that's human, right. mm -hmm. and if anything, you're going to make more mistakes, tripping yourself up, worrying about that's right. <laughs> when you could just really just live and breathe like everybody else. And so, if you make a mistake, and that's called misgendering somebody, mm -hmm. right? When you call mm -hmm. someone the wrong pronouns, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people like to say, "Oh, I'm so sorry," right, for that. I really want to push us to instead reply with like, thank you, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you say sorry to someone, usually what they will say back is, oh, well, that's okay. And we don't mm -hmm. want to normalize that misgendering people is okay because it's mm -hmm. not, right? But mm -hmm. if you didn't know me, you didn't know my pronouns and you didn't ask, you might make a mistake. And so if you do make a mistake and someone corrects you on it, you can say, you know what? Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me the knowledge that I need to respect you. And you only get to have a couple of mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. Can't meet the same person 10 or 15 times, continue to misgender them and then say, oh, I'm so sorry, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because then it's like, well, did you really care? Are you really doing the work? Right. Seeing me for who I am? Mm -hmm. Because that my pronouns and my name are a part of that. Um, yeah. and so you only get to have a couple of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so like, make sure that you're really doing the work. Um, and the thing is we do this work with our pets all the time. Someone comes over and they say, oh, your dog, she is so cute. He, right? It's like, mm -hmm. what the hey, like yeah. we're really defensive when people misgender our pets. We should also show up, you know, when people misgender our, our human friends too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Veronica, I'm glad you're back. 
Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm really glad you're back. Thank you. Um, what is something that you would like our audience to know about the work that you're doing in the community? Something that we might not know. That there are a lot more LGBTQ, or as we also say, sexual and gender minority um, in the city, in our families. It is foolhardy for us to say that I don't know any gay people. They just haven't come out to you yet. Uh, we mm. also say that our trans people, but they may not have come out to you yet. That's why your wife's point about treating every individual with respect is important because you don't know who people are out here. And that's real. And so we have to approach life. This, this life and this time requires us to approach life with an open mind and an open heart. So, Brother Moses, how do we support people with being able, how do we equip people to get to the point where they can follow your, your nurturing directive? I mean, how do people get to the point where they can be open-minded enough to, to say, I need to say to you what I need to say to you? I think it's so important for people to educate themselves. Part of what we see when we talk about homophobia and transphobia is genuine ignorance. And so I think it's important for people to understand one that we're all human beings and two to educate themselves about LGBTQ people, about sexual gender minority. Everybody with cell phone must have Google or some other search engine where you can type in. You know, do some research for yourself. I always advocate people to research for themselves and, and learn how, learn um, what's appropriate. And just learn about the different, you know, just learn about the different genders and orientations in the community. Mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges um, that that we that we deal with, Veronica, is so, so when people are in their own pain, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily have the empathy capacity to deal with others, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why one of the the uh, trauma that we have not dealt with is post-traumatic slave trauma. Mm. Um, and that we as a people, particularly of those of us of African descent, many of us are experiencing and living with intergenerational pain and trauma. Um, and so sometimes you'll find people so focused on their own survival Mm. That they're not necessarily um, uh, conscious um, of the need to pay attention to others. Now, I say that um, on one hand, um, that that might be what gets in the way. And I also know that people of African descent are some of the most giving and loving and caring people mm. I know in the world. Some of the most gracious and forgiving people that I know in the world. And so while they may not fully understand, they may not fully uh, get, they may not fully even um, accept, right? Um, there is a way that there is a graciousness um, that will show up. And, you know, I, you know, I've heard all, you know, in many of our families, well, you know, that's my gay cousin or that's my trans cousin. I ain't in the trans gender issues. I ain't in the gay people but mm -hmm. that's my cousin, right? So there's, there's an accepting of family and holding on. At the same time, we hold that people often lose, right? So it's, it's a both and in that. But I think that one of the things that you're naming is um, that we have to have space, as you talked about, for grief and healing of mm -hmm. our own stuff so that we have some capacity to hold somebody else's pain, to care about what somebody else's experience is. Um, and uh, to even, as Brother Moses was saying, to even look up something and, and, and worry about, you know, many times you will see some hurtful and hateful things happening within communities and people don't think that was right, but, you know, that's not now none of my business. I don't have the energy to kind of deal with all of that. I'm, I might even say something to, to them afterwards, um, mm -hmm. but uh, 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 not, um, not intervene, right, um, in, in moments. So I'm often, as I'm talking about bystanders, 
um, and folks who just kind of allow some of this uh, hurtful stuff to happen, um, that what we have to do is equip them with the mm -hmm. skills and the tools so that they can do their own healing, but also um, know what to say or know how they might show up um, when, when pain is happening. Profound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you talk about holding a space so that people can work through their own mm -hmm. stuff in mm -hmm. essence. But I found that um, many of us don't know how to do that. Yeah. They don't even know how to begin to do that. Yeah. So for us to expect that of someone when they don't even know, and even thinking about, I, I'll even you know go my own journey. You know, no one ever told me how to hold my own stuff, to deal with my stuff so I can help deal with other stuff. So where do, again, I guess I'm get back at the same point. Where do we begin? I mean, because everything you're saying, Reverend Washington is so important, but I think people have to have the tools, but how do we get people to the point where they want to get the tools? Yep. That's the thing, the work begins with the self first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think for some of us, just acknowledging the fact that we need to do that, mm -hmm. you know, so not even just acknowledging our trauma and our pain, but just acknowledging that that, that is there, that you've gone through these things, that, you know, these are experiences, it's showing up in your life, you know, in a way that's not healthy. And so, mm -hmm. you know, how do we do that? How do we bring attention to these things for people who are not seeing it? They can't see how they are towards others. They can't see that, you know, they're giving off something that's unhealthy or toxic and it's, it's you know, contaminating a relationship. How, how can we do that? How can we do that? And I think, again, one of the ways we do that is like this, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, kind of creating these opportunities where folks don't have to go into a building, right? Mm -hmm. Or go to an office. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and yes, they do have to invest in the logging on or signing on, uh, but they don't even have to do it at the same time that it's happening. Right. right. Um, and so sometimes just knowing that the opportunity is there um, uh, is enough to just prick something. Right. You know, uh, the, the whole work of Roberta's house. Right. is huge for us in the black community. Huge. Because all we do is take it to God in prayer and everything is just going to be all right. You know, Jesus is going to fix it. And, you know, that's just going to be the end of it. Right. Um, the fact that we have a space, programs, um, services that you can go to be in community with others who are navigating when the prayer didn't work. Mm. Right. Who are navigating um, when um, the fasting didn't work, who are navigating when, you know, just continuing to pay my tithes and going to the church didn't work to get me through this pain that I'm in. Mm -hmm. The services, the programs, the offerings of Roberta's house, then, um, and what I always say is, then the people out of there need to run and tell that. Mm -hmm. They need to go and tell people about that. And mm -hmm. that, that, I got my healing in the group that I did at Roberta's house, not Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. That mattered. Sunday morning matter, but that's not the only place mm -hmm. where healing can happen, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so we've got to look at all the, whether it's, the, um, you know, as Jabari talked about the school program. So, you know, we got to go to where the people are, right? Mm -hmm. So we know they come into school. We need some programs in the school, right? But um, what, are, what are we doing with our um, cultural programs and, and arts and music and all those things? What are we doing in athletics? We've got to use every venue to bring the work to them because mm. everybody is not going to come to it. Mm -hmm. So, And then that's going to produce what I always talk about is communal yep. healing, you know, because then you got that necessary connection that needs to go on. Yeah, that's right. I think it's also important to, to recognize and remember that it is, it is by design, right? It is intentional that we don't see each other in the ways that we should, right? It, it is on purpose that we don't mm -hmm. understand 
the diversity that we have always had, particularly as black people in gender, in sexuality, in family, in culture, it's because of uh, colonialism and colonization and white supremacy and patriarchy that our very histories have been stripped from us, right? Yeah. We, we started off understanding the many ways that humans show up in, in, in this world. And so when we talk about what the journey looks like, you first gotta decide, well, what are you trying to get to? What's the goal? Do you mm -hmm. want to learn? Do you want to go back and figure out all the very specific ways? Like it's intentional that you didn't learn all those words that we just right. shared with you in your health class, in your social studies right. class, in your sex ed class. That wasn't a mistake. People didn't just leave that out because they forgot about it. It was by design that we are programmed to hate each other in this way. Right. And so we have to really go back and you have to decide for yourself, what do you want? Do you wanna be a person who shows up at the pride parades and flies flags? Great, let's get you there. Do you wanna be a person who's able to interrogate that internal bias voice that comes up for you when you meet someone who you think you're in the LGBT community? Do you wanna be able to show up for your family member? Like, what do you want, right? And so it's been able to really, you gotta, in order for you to start, you gotta to have to decide where you'd like to finish. Who, who you wanna be, that's right. Mm -hmm. What do you wanna do? And then we can get you there. And I would say that if you want to show up, show up in love. And mm. love will lead you to combat your ignorance around this issue. I've heard a lot of parents um, talk about how, you know, they didn't understand everything their child was going through, but it was what love that caused them to seek out the help that they need. And first of all, people have to admit they need help. It's okay to need help. Right around the issue, and so even being open to letting love open your heart to say, "I need help. Can you help me?" is so it's a, an important milestone for people to understand that that love guide me. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. What are some ways um, we can support or do more to support the LGBTQ community? We talked about things kind of generally, but what are some, some action items? What are some specific things that we can do? Concrete, right? Google, she's free, you know? And so if you got to do a little bit of education just around concepts of gender and sexuality, start there, right? Start with your learning resources and then come up with questions. You may read stuff, but you don't even understand what you're reading, but you've done something, right? So I think that it all starts with education. The reason that we're able to show up and do this work is because we've had the privilege of this education. Mm. Not, not so many of us have had the privilege of learning about the nuances and the theory of gender and all of that good stuff that isn't given to us. And so we have to, you know, seek it. And so I would say that if you are, are, are if you are willing to go on this journey and you really want to start Googling stuff, right? That's number one. Number two, you know, I exist in the city to serve as a resource. I, I can see myself as a teacher, right? First and foremost, I'm an educator um, in the government and in the community. And so if you, you know, are looking for additional help, additional understanding, the mayor's office, uh, LGBTQ affairs, Baltimore City LGBTQ affairs, we are a resource. We have those LGBT 101 um, events that we do with Enoch Pratt. Um, there are so many different organizations that you can engage with. Um, and then also maybe look in your network. Who else do you know is really good at this? It can't be, you know, we as LGBTQ people can't be burdened with the discrimination and be burdened with teaching everybody mm -hmm. the discrimination. Right? So you have to sort of, you know, come to the fire also. Um, and so reach out to some friends who maybe aren't LGBTQ and say, hey, I'm, I'm looking to learn a little bit more about this and really see it as an internal control, an internal thing that you can do yourself um, and, and start to reveal resources for yourself because they're out there and then see where that takes you. Awesome. What, what you're saying beautifully is, um, and so I often say this for um, other minoritized folks, right? And so specifically as we look at race, what would you be telling white people? Right? What do you want them to be doing? Right? Like, like, so, so just like Jabari said, read a book, <laughs> make a friend, 
right? Go to a movie, uh, do something, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, how, you know, as, as we said, every, everything is Googleable. As, as we were talking, I just went and Googled how to support my gay and lesbian friends. Right. 10,000 mm -hmm. things come up, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I've realized, folks, is, you know, um, everything that comes up isn't necessarily the best work, but at least that's some place to start. Then mm -hmm. I say, get in relationship. Don't just have a theoretical understanding, make a friend, have a relationship with somebody that you can say, so I was reading this stuff. And, um, and so I'm just wondering your perspective on it. Um, uh, and you don't have to just ask queer folks, LGBTQ folks, you get to ask other folks who might know some queer folks, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, a lot of people do, right? So I was reading this, what's your perspective? So the more you bring the conversation outside of queer only space, you know, mm -hmm. I got four gay friends, that's what I'm gonna go talk to about this. That's the same stuff they did, white people do with black people. Well, let me go ask my black friend. Yeah. Get some other people, have some other conversations. Um, and, and in that, you begin to expand the conversation, you begin to expand your network, you begin to expand your knowledge, um, and um, you begin then to shift the culture dynamic, you begin to create another narrative, a counter narrative mm -hmm. to the one that Jabari just talked about in terms of, yes, it was intentional that that got left out. Yes, it was intentional that that got left out. But then you recognize that you're talking to lots of people who have power to shift that dynamic. You're talking to people who you know that's on the school board. You're talking to people who you know that got the pastor's ear that can say something about every time you use that scripture, you misuse it. Mm. Right. So um, use your own agency and power to begin to shift the dynamics of exclusion. And as you do that, you will reduce the grieving. Mm -hmm. um, you will reduce the number of um, partners who are not allowed to go into the hospital um, during COVID-19 uh, because they're not seen as a part of the family. That's mm -hmm. still a very real thing. Um, the, the family can decide your name doesn't get on the list, wow. right? Um, and, um, and so uh, we, we have to uh, all find our own responsibility and agency around what we're gonna do to kind of make that different. Yeah. Wow, thank you. This I'm excited. This conversation has just been amazing. It's only part one. We're gonna definitely, you know, invite you guys to come back out. We definitely have some other themes for the rest of the year. So next month we're gonna be talking about violence and trauma. So we definitely want to invite you all back to talk about that. Um, and so, you know, we definitely have other things coming up. Um, as we are wrapping up for today, what are some final thoughts? What are some final things that we want to leave our audience with? That's the first part. And then the second part is we want to provide our audience with contact information for you all or for other resources that can be helpful. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, leave us, leave us with those strong messages. Yes. So my, so, so I'll, I'll enter and then, uh, cause I don't want to come behind these two fellas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I'll say is Unity Fellowship Church of Baltimore, go to unityfellowshipchurch.org. Um, you will find out about our virtual services, our programs and all kinds of things um, where we invite folks to experience the divine anew. It doesn't matter what your religious, secular or spiritual background has been. It's a place that is grounded as brother Moses said in love. So join us in a loving space to again, uh, have a space to grieve and find your voice and to uh, find loving community. Uh, that's very important. Manyvoices.org is another great place for spiritual resources. Um, if you come from a Christian tradition and you're trying to navigate um, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, that's minoritized and the Bible, lots of great resources there. I wanna honor that um, all of us on this panel identify as male and, um, and that we don't have represented in terms of LGBT community, um, um, uh, either cis women or trans women. Um, mm -hmm. And so their voices are not present in this space. Mm -hmm. right? um, mm -hmm. And 
that I believe that while we had a lot to say, you would have gotten some different and additional stuff mm -hmm. um, uh, in that. And so I would just, I want us to, um, I, I, I could not, not own male privilege, right? Um, mm -hmm. In this conversation and how that, um, those vo our, our male voices often are the voices that get heard. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We hear you, that, that's part two. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so I guess when it comes to a final thought, um, my final thought would be, you know, if you're looking for something to honor in the LGBT community, start with the bravery. Start with the incredible bravery it takes for someone to wake up every day, look themselves in the mirror and look outside of the world and say, I am someone who is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer. Because of the way our world is set up, that takes such an incredible amount of bravery. Um, and so honor that bravery, just start there, that folks even can wake up and say that. And um, bravery really creates a lot of beauty. And so there's just so much beauty in the LGBTQ community, so much resilience yeah. and tenacity and talent. Um, and it's, it's just, it's an incredible group of folks. <laughs> so um, really honor that. Um, when it comes to, you know, contact information and resources, um, I'm the best on Facebook. We also have Instagram and Twitter. You can follow us at Balt City LGBTQ. So that's B-A-L-T-C-I-T-Y. LGBTQ. Um, that's where you'll get a lot of the news and updates from me um, about my work in the mayor's office. We have a lot of stuff uh, happening. There's a city council hearing happening on September the 15th, uh, addressing the well-being of the trans community here in Baltimore City. That's never been done before, uh, where our council is taking that up as a, as a legislative and important issue in our city. Um, and so please follow me there. Um, you, you know, my email address is jabari.liles um, at baltimorecity.gov. Um, and so, you know, you'll see how it's spelled somewhere else on this post, I'm sure. But um, I really love being accessible to not only the government, but to residents. Um, and so if you're looking for a resource or an opportunity or a place to start or just a conversation, I mean, I get all types of calls all the time, you know. Um, it's, it's my duty to be accessible and just the biggest, um, I'm just so fortunate to have this job. So um, use me, <laughs> your taxpayer <laughs> dollars are paying for it. So use it. Um, and it's just been my, my absolute pleasure to be here with you all to hear and support about the work of Roberta's house. Um, you know, just like uh, Dr. Washington said, this is such a huge important resource, particularly for black folks. Here we are in Baltimore City, and particularly for our black LGBTQ community, we lose a lot of life at the hands of state-based violence, uh, relational violence, and we need a place uh, to process all of that trauma and grief. And so um, having an ongoing partnership with Roberta's House um, to be uh, a real important uh, resource, place of resource for the LGBT community is, is uh, a huge uh, opportunity for me. So thank you and thank you to my esteemed co-guests. Um, y'all know I adore y'all and respect y'all so much. Um, Brother Moses. And last but not least, this conversation uh, reminded me of Matthew verses seven uh, through nine. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the meek peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. If we can act in our faith and like that, then this process will go in a much smoother way. Your heart will be open to flow and be inquisitive and be, be relaxed and come with the spirit of love. For your loved ones, I could be reached uh, on uh, Facebook, Merrick Moses, Twitter, Merrick Moses, Instagram, Merrick Moses, and I can be reached at Merrick Moses at gmail.com. That's M E R R I C K M O S E S at gmail.com. Thank you so much for this. This is absolutely awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. And if you guys are okay, we're going to post your contact information on our social media, if that's okay with you guys. 
Okay, good. Just making sure. You know, I, and I would just like to say, you know, you know, the storm did take some of my time away, but what I have, I, I really have treasured tonight because, you know, what I take away from this is the whole spirit of love. Mm -hmm. And that in order for healing to take place, we have to have the spirit of love. Um, and that's what I'm taking away from this conversation that we can do this. We can do this in love. Healing can come in love. But again, it's talking about community coming together mm -hmm. in the spirit so that everyone who's dealing with some type of grief, loss, or trauma has a special place to hold. And I invite everyone, you know, from my desk as the executive director of Roberta's House, we're here to serve. We're here to, to hold that space for you. Those of us that are listening to our broadcast tonight, please spread the word. You know, we are looking forward to this partnership um, that that have created. I mean, we have planted the seeds now, guys. Now we just want to put it and we're going to make it, we're going to nurture it because at the end of the day, our mission is to provide a safe place for anyone right. that is dealing with some type of loss. Yes. So I just, this is much love to you Thank guys you. for, Thank you, you know, you. coming out tonight, um, the storm, everything, and just sharing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this is the first step in educating and mm -hmm. You know, I think Janae and I, we don't have enough words to say thank you, but I do want to say to our audience is to please take in what you heard tonight and reach out to the panelists because they can get you on the right road to what a healing looks like for you. And that's an individual journey. So on behalf of all of us, thank you for coming together. We did some real talk. That's and right. we you this dialogue. So look out. Um, those of us that are listening, Real Talk will continue. We're going to be back on Monday. We're going to be back Wednesday. And gentlemen, this is an invitation. We're going to invite you back. All right. We look yes, forward absolutely. to it. Absolutely. All right. absolutely. Much love. Much Take love. Take care, my brothers and sisters. Thank you, thank thank you. you all thank you. for yeah. tuning in. And we just want to thank you all. And we hope that you have a great night. And hopefully the storm doesn't impact you terribly. So just have a good night, everyone.